the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this latest installment of our AI for Climate Science Discovery Series, which is part of the broader UN ITU AI for Good program. Um, this week, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Amy McGovern. Amy got her PhD in computer science, actually, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and now leads the Idea Lab at the University of Oklahoma. We're really excited to have her here today and talking about her work, which I think the most, most pertinent of which is the um, NSF AI Institute for Research on Trustworthy AI in Weather and Climate and Coastal Oceanography, um, which I'm really excited for her to talk more about today and, and share the, the fantastic work that they're doing there. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Amy, and uh, take it away when you're ready. Okay, I am ready and I will get my PowerPoint shared. Of course, I'm no longer on slide one since we did the uh -huh. checking of the PowerPoint. There we go. Perfect. Okay, we're good. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. I am, I am, as he said, I'm a professor in the University of Oklahoma. I'm jointly appointed in the School of Computer Science and the School of Meteorology. Um, and I'm the director for the NSF AI Institute, which is, has a very long name on research and trustworthy AI and weather, climate, and coastal oceanography. But if you wanna learn more about us beyond what I talk about today, you wanna contact us, et cetera, our website has our short name, which is ai2es.org. Um, there was a there was a short name on the original proposal, but it got renamed by NSF. Um, but I'm going to talk about what AI2ES is doing. And the answer to that, by the way, is that AI2ES is doing so much that I can't actually talk about everything we're doing in one 45 minute talk. So I'm going to give a sample of some updates of what we've been doing for the last year after I give you an overview of AI2ES. And then I'm going to talk about the importance of convergence researchers with one of the things that we're doing. And, and that'll get us into some other uh, results from AI2ES. So... Let me jump into, um, this is, this is I don't know, this is the slide of many logos and it keeps growing because we keep adding partners. Eventually I'm gonna run out of room on this slide and they're all gonna have to be really small, but it's exciting that we keep adding partners. So that's awesome. So um, the, the I'm gonna start with the, that partner row, the, the top row of the partners, which is sort of in the middle of the slide and I'm not sure that you could see my pointer if I, I use it. So I'm just gonna go with in the middle of the slide. You can see it, it starts with OU, we're the lead institution. All of those um, institutions are now involved in AI2ES. We have three new partners that are over on the side, SDSU, U, uh, University of California, Irvine, and FIU. We're all involved through the new program through NSF called Expand AI, which is partnering with HSIs and MSIs. All of the other academic partners there um, have been there uh, since the beginning. Um, and then the second row is all of our private industry partners. And then the bottom row is government and uh, federally funded research lab partners. 
Um, and so that's just a way of saying that if you get really excited about what we're doing, um, I'd be glad to talk to you about how we're going to, we're trying, my goal is to grow AI2ES. And so I'd be glad to talk to you about how we can partner up to continue to grow what we're doing. Um, our goal, our overall goal is that we're developing novel, physically based, meaning based in the laws of physics, AI techniques that are demonstrated to be trustworthy. And I'm going to talk a lot about what trustworthy means and that will improve both prediction and understanding and communication of a variety of high impact weather hazards. And all of that with a goal of trying to improve our climate resiliency. So let's jump into sort of a picture of what, what we're doing. Um, and this picture has been updated. If you've seen me give this talk in the past, this picture has actually changed in the last few months because we decided that it was really important that we highlight the partnerships in there. So I, I still don't know if my mouse is showing up, so I'm gonna go with the gesturing. But the left-hand side of this equation, you know, trustworthy AI, environmental science and risk communication, we're all working together in a convergent manner. Um, and you know it, we are, and then we'll talk about what that convergent manner means. We're not just AI scientists working in isolation, and that's really key to, to generating the better results that we're trying to do. Um, and then the next part of the equation is the broadening participation. It used to just be broadening participation workforce development. We've realized how much our partnerships are bringing to this equation, so that they are all also part of this convergent effort. That the that all of that together becomes AI to ES. Um, uh, that is over on the right. And then surrounding everything we do, we're making sure that all the AI we're developing is ethical, responsible, and use inspired. And I'll talk about what use inspired means on the next uh, few slides. So that gets you an idea of sort of the broad goals of what we're doing. And what I'm going to do today is primarily focus on the left hand set of circles with a little bit on the middle set of circles, just because, as I said, we're doing so much that I can't do everything in 45 minutes. Um, looking a little bit into the, um, the foundational research in trustworthy AI, and I'm going to I think I need to hide this, hide the floating panel. Hold on. There we go. Otherwise it shows up, I know, as a blank on your screen. So uh, on that left-hand circle, we had uh, that we were working on trustworthy AI. And what we've done is we're, we're doing, as I said, convergence research. So we're telling the story of working across all of the disciplines. And we are. But I want to say that inside AI, in this use-inspired way, which we'll talk about on the next set, next slide, we are looking at what's different about the AI that you need for earth science and climate science and understanding weather. And in particular, it has very different needs than a lot of what's going on in traditional computer science. It needs to be based on laws of physics. It needs to handle the spatio-temporal context of your data. And the use in life and death decision-making is very different from what the vast majority of AI applications are doing. Not to say that medical AI is not doing life and death decision-making because it most certainly is, but the traditional AI that is done is generally not life and death decision-making. Um, so we have a set of foundational topics there, some of which I will be able to talk about today some generative AI, physics-based AI, robust AI, and certainly quantification, explainable AI, and ethical AI. And this is just, this. the first part of my talk is just an overview. I'll jump into some results for these um, in a bit. To get you to what the use inspired means, the use inspired, by, this is a NSF's terminology, the use inspired means that we're inspired and, and that the use cases are inspiring the research that we are doing, that we very much are, it's inspiring new foundational AI contributions as well as our risk communication and our new contributions, geoscience. So the five areas that we're looking at are convective weather, which for those who may not live in the Midwest and live and breathe convective weather means thunderstorms, which means all of the hazards that come from thunderstorms, you know, wind, lightning, tornadoes, hail, flooding, et cetera. Uh, winter weather, uh, where we're looking at both major winter storms as well as freezing rain, visibility, things like that. Tropical cyclones, which are hurricanes for the United States, tropical cyclones everywhere else, um, and subseasonal to seasonal prediction. And then coastal oceanography, where we're looking at a variety of impact of different applications of which I will talk about a couple of them. One of them is shown here on the graph with the um, looking at loop current eddies, which are very large scale circulations in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and then fog prediction. Um, I'm also gonna talk about the turtles. The turtles show up on our logo. I will talk about the turtles today. But right now, what I'm trying to do is show you those three circles so that you have an idea of what the three circles are and how we're gonna work together. So this is the third part of that circle. We had the AI, we had the, the use cases, and now we have the foundational uh, research and risk communication. And the goal here is that we really want to understand the trust in AI, what it means, and to use that to actually make a cycle so that the AI, that, that this improvement in our understanding of what trust means improves our AI that we're generating. And our risk communication team is our social science team. And they're really working with our end users to really understand their needs and understand why they trust the AI or don't trust AI. And they are a large part of why we're able to do the convergent research. We're integrating all of the knowledge across the different ideas. Um, in the different domains. Um, and so they are an interdisciplinary team. They're working with our end users. Our end users for AI2ES are primarily professional end users. We're primarily, I know that this audience is international. We're looking at professional end users primarily in the United States because we're funded by the United States. So the National Weather Service forecasters, emergency managers, 
Um, we are trying right now to work on some collaborations with uh, people in Europe. Um, but again, we're funded for the United States based work. So we're working on how we can get that scaled up. But um, we're, we'll be talking a little bit more about what they're doing, but they're working in these semi-structured interviews with our end users to actually understand what it means to be to, for the AI to be trusted or not trusted and what we need to do to adjust the AI to make sure that it's fitting into that trusted category. Um, and I said I was going to briefly talk about the workforce uh, development and broadening participation. I will be glad to do that more probably in the q and I'm only going to have two slides on it for right now, just because I wanted to focus on the research part today. But our workforce development and broadening participation are very much intertwined um, and that we want to broaden participation in AI and AI for weather uh, by developing programs for all ages. And this includes uh, we have a, a we co-sponsor a middle school coding camp. Um, but it includes a community college curriculum where we have an occupational skills award that is 14 hours in AI that then can be taken into college or taken right back to your work. Um, and that the, this partnership is, is um, with a Hispanic serving minority serving institution so that we're making sure that we actually really are broadening and participation for the very audience that we're trying to make sure we're reaching, which is the audience that traditionally isn't getting AI. Um, and then we're working on adi creating additional partnerships for this. Another part of our um, workforce development, and I'll pause here to say that on a bunch of slides, I have links to publications and they will show up in green down near the bottom of the link, uh, down the bottom of the slide. Um, and I don't know what happened, why there's extra green text on this slide. I checked the slides right beforehand and whew, there's an extra green text on the slide. Ignore that in the middle. Um, but there's pub four publications there that are also part of our workforce development and broadening participation plan. Um, so just to give you a hint of how many people we were funding last year, so you're, we're in year four now, and yeah, in year three, we funded 12 different postdocs, 19 grad students, nine RU, which is research experiences for undergraduates, and 23 undergraduate researchers, and then had 21 students in that uh, community college program. And we have tutorials um, that are on AI for Weather, and that's what those publications are that are at the bottom. The pictures from the K-12 coding camp, um, the, the tutorials are showing up on the bottom. There's a, a two-part tutorial for doing machine learning um, for operational meteorologists. Um, and then a tutorial on XAI for meteorology, as well as uh, a, a write up about what we did with our summer school. Um, so now I'm gonna jump into a larger part of the talk, which will be sampling our research updates. Um, again, it's a sampling because as you see that we are doing a lot. And so I don't have time to jump into all of it, but I'm gonna try to give you a sample across some of the different use cases, just so you can see some of what's going on. So this particular slide came from a student who just graduated this year focusing on improving tor prediction of tornadoes. And we've had a lot of traditional work on looking at tornadoes in supercells, which are the types of storms that form in the uh, United States, typically in the Midwest, and create the very very most destructive tornadoes, the F4s and the F5s that you hear about. Um, but uh, mesoscale convective systems also generate tornadoes, and they are the least well predicted. So we had a student who was working on understanding how we can improve the prediction of such mesoscale uh, convective system tornadoes and created a very unique data set, which people could go access if they want to, called GridRad. Um, and there's a, a, a history of these storms across the United States for many years. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great data set for doing machine learning on it. So there's a paper there that's down there that's talking about how to compare uh, tornadic and non-tornadic uh, mesoscale convective systems so that we can then hopefully feed that into a machine learning algorithm that can do a better job of predicting uh, these mesoscale convective tornadoes. And often, um, since I know my audience is not necessarily all in the Midwest, often these storms are coming in overnight, which makes them even more destructive because people aren't necessarily paying as much attention to their warning systems. So the mesoscale convective system tornadoes may not be the F5 tornadoes, but they're still going to kill people when they come through overnight and you didn't get any warning. Jumping into a different use case, because um, what I said I'm going to do is do a sampling of these updates for the beginning, and then we'll jump a little bit more depth into a couple of them in a, in a few minutes. Um, this is it looking at the winter weather. So in the winter weather case, um, and I should pause here and say that at the bottom of the slides, I'm also trying to make sure that I'm highlighting the different uh, groups that are working on it. So this is joint effort between Albany and the University of Oklahoma. Um, the, the, this particular task, the goal was to estimate atmospheric visibility just from camera images. So a camera image is just you know, one 2D slice, it doesn't give you any depth information. And the question is, can you train a model that will actually give you that depth information and tell you how well you're seeing um, the, what the visibility is? And you might think, well, why in the world we need this? We have visibility sensors, but it turns out visibility sensors are expensive and we don't have them in a wide variety of places. So for example, um, in the United States for aviation, there's a fair amount of visibility sensors at each one of the major airports in the continental United States but not so much in Canada and Alaska because they're more rural 
and in particular in Alaska, it has the vast majority of the general aviation accidents, and it's largely due to visibility because they don't have the sensors, so they're they're not necessarily getting a great weather report. So if we could do something like create a good visibility prediction from these camera images, we could vastly, hopefully, improve the safety. Um, so this is a picture of one of the predictions from a deep learning model. Um, the paper on this is still being uh, written, but you can go see. We just had our main conference two weeks ago, which is AMS, the American Meteorological Society annual meeting, and all the talks are recorded. So I have, when I don't have a paper at the bottom, I have a link to AMS and you can go find the title and you can see the recorded talk to see more details about it. But what this animation is showing you is the prediction and the truth values um, for the deep learning model that is learning to compare between a reference image and a uh, and the image that you're given to say, is it more visible than this reference image to be able to give you the prediction of what the visibility is. And it's, it's a really interesting uh, station because this one, the tree line, that arrow got moved. The arrow is supposed to be pointing at the tree line back there. It's about a half mile away from the camera. So it's hard to see the visibility beyond a half mile. Whereas in my previous slide, there were some pictures up here of Manhattan where you can actually see clear out to 10 miles and you can get a better visibility prediction. Okay, jumping to another um, area. I said that we had some coastal oceanography and I promised I was gonna talk about turtles and here are my turtles. One of the cool things, and, and I like to talk about the turtles because they're so different from everything else we do. Almost everything else we do is, is very weather related. Turtles are saving, saving sea turtles. Who doesn't wanna save the sea turtles? When it gets really cold in South Texas, and again, I'm gonna assume you're not super familiar with South Texas, Texas being one of the most, you know, being the southernmost state, sticking way down there. The area that we're looking at is at the Southern point of Texas. It does not get cold down there very often. When it gets cold, the sea turtles are cold blooded and they get something called cold stunned or because they go hypothermic. They are more vulnerable to illness. They rise up to the top of the surface of the water and they can get run over by the shipping traffic. And the goal is to be able to predict these cold stunning events so that the rescuers can go out and rescue the turtles before they die, before they get run over the shipping traffic and also be able to stop that shipping traffic. So as a part of that, you want to make sure that your AI is very, very much trustworthy because you don't want to be stopping the shipping traffic in what is the third most trafficked bay in the United States for ship shipping if you're not sure about what you're doing. You want to be able to say, I want to stop it at this hour. I want to restart it at this hour. And you're holding off only while we're rescuing those turtles and and and, and anything else that may be getting cold stunned. Um, so you want to have a really uh, firm prediction of what the air temperature and the water temperature is going to be. Um, and this is a collaboration across a huge variety of agencies, which is why there's so many logos down there. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on with this most recently, um, so there was a talk at AMS about this, um, was improving the prediction of that uncertainty. Because one of the things they're asking about, you want to really narrow that window of when you're closing the shipping. And we would like to know how uncertain you are about those air, those air temperature and water temperature predictions. And so we're developing um, a way to actually understand how uncertain we are. And this turns out to be harder than you might think because the uncertainty about events that are very much out of the distribution of what you might normally observe is hard to estimate because for example, the cold sunning event that happened two years ago was very much out of anything anybody had seen before. They had 10,000 turtles that they had to rescue, but nobody had really seen anything like that. So how do you estimate your uncertainty about something you've never really seen before? It's a hard task and it's a hard task for machine learning and AI to really predict. Um, Jumping into another coastal oceanography application, um, the, and the, the reference for this is on the next page, trying to look at predicting loop current eddies, which are the large scale circulations in the Gulf of Mexico. They have an effect on everything that's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, but if you wanna think immediately upon businesses, it's affecting the oil wells that are out there because these very large circulations can, can affect everything that's happening around the wells. And we would like to be able to improve our predictions of them. And so there's a recent paper out on archive, it's uh, under peer review right now, um, about a deep learn, a purely data-driven method that we've developed called uh, OceanNet. This is developed out of the uh, North Carolina State University, and I highly recommend it. It's really cool new work. As far as I know, there, it's the only data-driven uh, deep learning method out there for ocean prediction. So trying to understand the circulations of the ocean and giving you a data set that is a, a, an amazing data set of archive of what's going on in that part of the ocean. Um, I'm going to jump into, so that was just a sampling sort of across the use cases. It wasn't all the use cases. It was just a group of them. I'm going to jump a bit into the cross-cutting foundational AI. So what we're doing in the different uh, AI uh, use cases, and I'm going to jump into just a few examples. So this first example is looking at trying to make sharper forecasts. What we really want is this image on the left-hand side where we have a really sharp image. And that is a sharp image by any definition of you know, sharpness that you might come up with, but it turns out figuring out how you define sharp is hard. What AI traditionally gives you 
is something that measures well on skill scores by MSE, but it looks really blurry. And the problem is that when you're trying to work with end users who are used to what the real world looks like, which the real world is sharp, the real world is not blurry, um, then they consider it maybe not to be as good of a forecast, not as trustworthy, because it's very much very fuzzy. And so they'd like to, we'd like to find a way to create these sharper images. So we, this is a multi-step process. Um, and what we have done with this in the first step um, is that we have created a benchmark of data, metrics, and a tutorial paper that I have the link for on the next paper, or the next page, um, that is about the different loss functions. So let me just jump to that, keep the same image there. Um, so we have a, a set of suitable metrics uh, that we've identified to measure meteorological sharpness, and then a set of vignettes in that paper that talk about how they work on different data sets. Um, and so that paper is available. Um, it's not yet on archive because there's some things we wanted to do to it, but we wanted to get it available for AMS. So it is available off our website right now. Um, it will eventually go up on archive probably within the next two or three weeks. Um, and then it'll go under peer review. Uh, but it is it intended to be a tutorial so that you can go see these metrics and see what, you're, what you can do with the metrics so that you can measure sharpness. Um, and then the second step of that is then how can we, there are a lot of people saying, well, oh, but I just do X for my model and it makes a better, sharper image. Well, if you don't know how you're measuring that sharpness, then that's an interesting question. And how do you know if it's really better? So the second paper we're working on, there's an AMS poster on it, but we're also working on a paper we'll have submitted by the end of the semester on an exploration of the different AI architectures and how they affect sharpness based on the metrics that we've released with the sharpness. So we'll be looking into generative AI models and traditional AI models and how they can, how you can improve the sharpness and how Sometimes you can make it a lot worse. So it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm helping to lead that with a uh, undergraduate, which is why I know the paper will be submitted by the by the end of the semester because he's graduating. I want to get it in. Um, looking at another area in the in the foundational AI contributions, looking at under, estimating uncertainty quantification, um, and being able to say how we can. So learning a method called evidential deep learning. So learning how you can do aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty and figuring out how you can say how you're, what part of the uncertainty you're really sure about, what part is coming from the data, what part's coming from the model, et cetera. Um, and the nature of time, that's about what I'll say about that slide. But I'll jump to another part of uncertainty quantification, which gets us into the, the question of trustworthiness as well, that, that figuring out how you're estimating uncertainty is part of the trustworthiness and then figuring out how you can visualize that uncertainty is another part of the trustworthiness. How do the users develop it? The, the, the trust in these models and what can we do with visualizing this uncertainty in a way that would help them to feel better and understand the trust. And some of that can be visualizing the uncertainty using sort of traditional metrics that are shown up in the upper part here, um, where you're looking at a sounding and then you're looking at sort of uncertainty around it. Some of it could be allowing them to manipulate this data and then see what happens with the models, for example. So what role does interactivity play in building their conceptual understanding of the AI models and the role in trust? And these are really unanswered questions. You know, they're questions that we are diving into, but questions that I don't have an answer for you right now. I know you'd like to say, put your hand up and say, I want to answer that. So do I, is the answer to that. Um, and jumping just a few more um, sort of contributions in the, in the AI field, um, looking at explainable and interpretable AI. Um, we had that tutorial that I mentioned earlier. So that's, there's a graphic up there from the tutorial. Um, and then we had another tutorial, the, the, so the paper for that one's on the lower left-hand side. Um, talking about what the best XAI methods are for, for uh, earth science methods, because XAI methods were traditionally developed for more traditional AI fields, like, you know, your faces that you're trying to look at, or your birds and your sunsets, you're trying to understand what the, you know, why is it a, why is it a face or something like that. But those don't necessarily apply to the data that shows up in earth science and trying to understand how that works. So there's a tutorial paper, um, and then the, the Mamalaka's paper is diving into knowing what the answer should have been on a synthetic earth science data set and then seeing which one of the XAI methods can give you something that approximates that method. And I think that some of the answers may surprise you. Part of the answer, by the way, is that there is no one method. It would be really nice if there was one method. We would all just jump forward with that. But that probably doesn't surprise anybody. Um, and then I just want to, um, before I jump into the convergence results, I want to jump into a couple of foundational contributions from the risk communication team. Because what the risk communication team has been doing is trying to really understand why the models might be uh, trustworthy or why they, they'd be less trustworthy. And they're really looking at professional end users. And in the cases of the data and the papers that I'm, I have on the next slide, we're looking at um, primarily forecasters and emergency managers, but we are in the process of diving into, especially with that ocean, ocean net that I showed you a few minutes ago, diving into some other companies, for example, because as I said, that it matters for the, the oil companies that are in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so, we had two papers uh, on trust this year. Can you not run the microwave right now because it makes my AirPods go? 
Okay, well, I hope I don't fuzz out for a minute. Uh, apparently, my microwave is going to run in the background behind me. Um, there, uh, so we have two papers on risk communication on trust this year that I highly recommend. One of them just came out in uh, risk analysis, and the, the URL for it is right there. The other one you'll have to get by emailing me because it's still under review, um, but it hopefully will be out sometime soon. But if you're really much very much interested in it, I'll be glad to, to give it to you. Um, so what I want to do for the rest of the talk is jump into convergence research and what I mean by convergence research and then how we're using inside AI2S, how we're using convergence research to create that trustworthy AI and to create innovative ideas and, and then finally to do foundational science discovery. So let's start with what convergence research is because I don't think everybody lives and breathes NSF terminology. So NSF terminology is that that convergence research is you're working on a specific compelling problem and then you have deep integration across the disciplines. And, and in our case, that's AI, the atmospheric and ocean sciences and the risk communication. And then characteristics of a successful convergent project um, is that, that we're working, the need to get to work together is really compelling. Well, for anybody who's working on weather and climate, the need is very compelling because we're all trying to improve our understanding of the climate change and how we can be more resilient. Our, the team needs to be ready to work together to actually learn each other's language. They have integration of the knowledge, tools, and modes of thinking. And then we have the involvement of the next generation of researchers, which is definitely the case for what we're doing because we have our postdocs, our grad students, and our undergrads working together. And then over there on the right is just a weather joke. I don't know my audience to know how many of you are weather versus climate versus AI, but for the non-weather people, this is intended to be a weather joke of convergence made visible because it's the intertropical convergence zone. Um, so it's all the convergence coming together. Sometimes jokes are a little bit less funny when you have to explain them, but I wanna make sure you don't just wonder what that, that picture is there for. Um, and what we've done is we've found significant synergy. I know that that's a buzzword, but I really mean it. We're finding synergy through convergence. But and what we really want is to understand that we're not working in isolation on these environmental science or science or atmospheric science problems. The interdisciplinary work really brings new ideas. It also brings challenges. So I'm not bringing up convergence just to say, you should just go do convergence. Everybody should do convergence. Everybody should do convergence, but it's hard. It's not easy stuff to get going. You have to figure out that you have to get everybody learning to speak the same language because the AI researchers and the, the atmospheric scientists, for example, it turns out that they, they use the same skill scores, but they call them by different names and they don't necessarily know that right away, right? And, oh, well, my skill score is better. They're identical. They're mathematically identical, but you didn't necessarily know that. That's just an example of speaking the same language. You need to make sure that the, the use inspired research in one translates to foundational contributions in another, that you're not just doing applied, for example, if you're trying to make sure that you're doing foundational contributions. And you need to make sure that the, the teams stay focused on the key questions and that everybody sees the need for working together because there's always that one person who wants to work on their own little island and doesn't want to work with other people. Um, and, and you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe that person works on their own little island. But I think the broader scale, if we're trying to solve these large challenging problems, we really need to make sure we're working together. Um, and then specific to the need for the social scientists, I mentioned that they are key to getting our convergence research going. But our initial team of social scientists was really tiny. And I put that in all caps for a reason. It was two people. Then we hired two postdocs. Now you have four people. Keep in mind, we're funding about 70 people across all of AI2ES. Four people is not a lot of those number of people. We want to show everybody the power of working with the social scientists, but we want to make sure that that social science team doesn't get overwhelmed. So with that said, we have successfully worked on converg convergence research across a wide variety of applications. And so I'm going to jump into to, to one of them. Um, and so the one that I'm gonna jump into is looking at convective weather. Um, and so convective weather, I, I gave earlier that it's the thunderstorms, the tornadoes, the wind, the hail. Um, in the United States, it causes about 55% of the billion dollar disasters. So it's causing a large number of those. And we, we're not gonna be able to stop the convective weather, but if we can generate AI that better predicts the convective weather, then we can do a better job of protecting those resources. And so what I'm gonna jump into uh, just on this one, I have, I have a couple of quotes from our interviews from, from the convective weather so that, you know, how hard is it? Oh, the shear's not very strong. The cape's mediocre. Look at that. These storms mean business or we didn't see that coming. It, it's hard. These storms look exactly the same and you need to, the AI needs to really learn to distinguish between the two because even the forecasters with the data they have don't necessarily have the, the means to, to distinguish between the storms because one storm looks really mean and all of a sudden drops a tornado and another one looks mean but never does anything. So uh, the next few slides are jumping into uh, the recent paper, which I have cited at the end, about what AIML guidance uh, features and uh, the forecasters are deeming trustworthy. Um, and so what we did for this is we had this started uh, in, in the middle of COVID time. So it was all very virtual, started with two 
products that we already had at the beginning of AI2S from prior work and then develop these interviews and did the interviews and now you know have processed the interviews and turned them into a paper where we're asking them how they assess the trustworthiness of these two products. So one of them was predicting the mode of the storm. It is it super cellular, is it linear, et cetera. Um, and one of them was predicting hail, the probability of hail. And then I did interviews with 16 different uh, National Weather Service forecasters. And, and, and I say they, I was not involved in these interviews. I'm, predict I'm talking about the results. Um, and then they did quantitative and qualitative analysis. And the interviews looked like questions where they introduced the product, they showed them examples of those products, and then they asked them questions about specific ways that they would understand the trustworthiness and how the explainability of the product uh, related to the trustworthiness of that. And so they for example, had some sticky notes that they could move around and they were doing this all, as I said, virtually. So they had Google Docs that they were sharing and they could move around sticky notes and take notes. And they incorporated Think Aloud technology to ask them these questions. Um, and they asked basically all of these interview structures works across all of our use cases. And they, they did that analysis. And then I just have a, a bit of, of quotes that are coming out of this. So when you think about the term trustworthiness, what might it mean in the context of AML guidance for severe weather forecasting? And this forecaster says, well, we're not in the classic supercell land. Our storm mode's very messy. So what works in Oklahoma or Kansas, those who are not from Oklahoma, Kansas, where, where we get the supercells, they might not get as often here. So I wanna say, I wanna make sure that the, that the guidance is encompassing the weather we see here, right? They really want to see experience and they want to see that it wasn't just working great in some other place. It, if it's going to be more trustworthy, it has to work in, in their place. Um, and then another quote that's an interesting one. I liked it. I, I liked that it said it was trained by a human. When it comes to storm mode, it can be kind of tough to classify some of these. So it's more an increase in trustworthiness knowing that the data came from a human, which I think is also an interesting thing. So you don't, for example, automate your labeling and then say that this is doing great because it learned the automated labeling. Um, and, and another quote, you know, you got to understand how these things are put together, how they're made to have a deep understanding of what it's giving you, what it's giving you is what it's doing. Understanding that model is essential, but there's degrees of what you need. It, that really comes down to our end user needs. And so there's the link to the paper. Um, it is under its, uh, I think this says major, I think it's actually under minor now. I didn't update that this morning, uh, but it should be out relatively soon. Um, but it is highlighting how the interviews worked and has lots more quotes about how that how you can understand the nature of trust for these forecasters. Uh, and I just say that forecasters are not a monolith. What works for one forecaster in one situation doesn't work for all forecasters. And I think that's an important point to make about trust for AI in general, because I think that users in particular would like to be able to say, well, I want to make a test, you know, some standard. And I want to be able to say the stamp, this AI is trustworthiness, is trustworthy. Rather. But you can't really do that. Because what works for one end user doesn't necessarily work for other end users. And it isn't necessarily something you can just have a stamp. You can say, this is trustworthy AI. And, and then second, AI trust is a continuum. And you don't necessarily start out trusting something. And you are going to increase or decrease your trust through familiarity with using that product. Um, and then they, finally, they want the forecasters want information. They want to be able to get as much information as they can. But they're all different in what information they want. They want to be able to understand. They want to make sense of their product. Some of them want to really dive deeply into the XAI and some of them don't care at all. They just want to be able to see how it works on a variety of cases. This, I hope, was showing you that it was very convergent because this was not AI researchers doing the interviews. It was not atmospheric scientists doing the interviews. The AI researchers and the atmospheric scientists worked together to create the product. The risk communication team did the interviews and then all of us are able to see what we need to adjust in that product to make a better AI product overall. Um, and, and this is, you know, we're working across a variety of use cases. And as we said, we only had four risk communication researchers at this point. So we don't have all these results for all of our use cases, but we are working on it. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna show you an example of, of another way that convergence research is useful across AI2ES. And that is that you can, when you have these diverse teams, um, you can create new ideas and lead to new ways of thinking about the problems. So we have four examples that I could talk about in the nature of time. I'm only going to talk about the fourth one, but I want to mention the ocean network that I mentioned earlier comes from a convergent team where you're trying to create this deep learning ocean model. And there were questions that just the ocean scientists alone were working on that they hadn't thought about until they started working together with the risk communication researchers and said, wait a minute, this is really improving our model. It's really improving what we're doing. Uh, and, and that comes together to give you an example of new ways of thinking about things. Same for the fog predictions. And then same for that paper that I mentioned earlier about analyzing literature on trust in AI across disciplines. That was a very large group of interdisciplinary people trying to look at how trust is characterized in the literature across both social science and 
uh, AI and a variety of disciplines because they all look at trust from a different lens. And the nature of trying to get through, you know, the talk and be able to answer questions and things like that, I'm going to talk only about the, the final one. And that's because I lead that effort. So I have more information to be able to dive into it. So the effort that I'm leading on this is in the ethical and responsible AI. And we have two papers um, here with working on a third, but we're going to start. The, the first one is focusing on why we need ethical and responsible AI for environmental sciences. And I want to say this is a convergent team because this involved people across atmospheric science, AI science, and verse communication. And we, when we first started saying, you know, all the ways that AI can go wrong for environmental sciences, any one of those groups only comes up with a couple of these numbers. When you put the team together is when you get the larger scale set of ways that AI can go wrong. This came from dis discussions in, initially with people who were saying, seeing things that were showing up in the news about the way that AI was going wrong in the news of, for example, well, you trained it all in white faces and it doesn't see any black faces. And they're saying, oh, that doesn't apply to weather. And we're saying, but wait, it does apply to weather. Maybe you're not seeing the faces, but you're seeing a variety of other issues that apply to weather. So we have this first paper that shows you ways that AI can go wrong. And then we have a second paper that just came out. It's in press, but you can get the early online release um, that's looking at a categorization focusing specifically on bias. And here we have four categories of bias. Um, systemic and cultural bias, human bias, data bias, and statistical and computational bias. And I'll dive into those more in a second. Um, but I just want to say that you can get to the paper at the URL that is there. Looking at systemic and structural biases, um, these are biases that exist in just sort of the background of society. Um, and they may exist in the historical records of your data. So for example, uh, just looking at tropical cyclones, for example, the satellite, the satellite measurements in the beginning weren't nearly as good as the satellite measurements are now. That's just a historical bias in your data just based on the, the quality of your instruments. There can be social bias that, that shows up. Um, and that can lead to, you know, by, so for example, in a, in a weather one, that the max temperature forecasts are more accurate in cities with a higher average household income. And then that can lead to bias in your AI models. And finally, institutional biases. Um, the biases at the institutional level are, are very hard to find because they're hidden in the background. It's, you know, what you assume is just the normal for, what's going on inside your institution. What's counted is what really matters. So I'm gonna give an example on the next slide of looking at tropical cyclone initiation inside the National Her Weather Service. Declaring that something is a tropical cyclone is much more frequent to happen when there's daylight than when it's not. Not to say it's not happening, it's just more frequent in the daylight because there was a bias for looking for those visible, visible bands. Um, and that makes sense, especially given the lower quality satellites that existed in the past because you wouldn't necessarily see all of the structure of the hurricane. And as you can see in our animation here, you can see a lot more structure once it's visible. But if you're training your AI model, you don't want it to only wait till daylight to declare tropical cyclones. Um, and data biases, uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing the human biases for this just for the purposes of just trying to give you a couple of examples. Um, data biases can come from how you're selecting your data, um, but I, I will briefly just say that the human biases there, there could be many more than just four categories of human biases. If you go look in the literature, there's you know hundreds of categories of different human biases. We pick the four that most affect AI for earth sciences, which is that we get overloaded, we get we have issues with our attention, working memory, and we're trying to make sense of things. All of those interact with how our data biases could happen. And in particular, for example, um, the, the systemic and structural biases and the human biases can interact with uh, the selection of the data, the data that's available for us to choose to train the AI model, and then the interpretation of that data, how we're taking that data and turning it into something that's AI ready. And then the processing, how we're turning, how we're actually, actually going through the data. And this could both introduce and adjust for bias. And then there could be physics bias. And that one's pretty unique to AI for earth science. Um, and so I have an example of that one where the physics bias can come from just how the laws of physics affect the data that you can collect. So this is an example from Hurricane Dorian, where the inner eyewall changes are basically discrete based on when the microwave data is passing over versus the, the, the not microwave data that you're getting, so the simulated data. So you can see that the eyewall changes are not really discrete, by the way. That's not how it happens in reality. What's happening in reality is we just don't have uh, you know, the high quality data that we need. Um, and I think, this is going to put me ending just about on time. Jumping into that tropical cyclones, thinking about another way that convergent teams and convergent research can really 
do something great for uh, for our our ability to to develop AI for a wide variety of applications. But also like to look at foundational science uh, discovery. And so why do that for tropical cyclones, for example? Tropical cyclones have a huge societal impact across the world. My pictures have all been in the United States, but tropical cyclones affect everybody around the world. And our understanding of these physical tropical cyclone processes is limited by our abilities of how much data we can collect right now. And what we're doing in this project is using an AI sensor that can generate synthetic microwave imagery. So let me jump into that so that we can understand how, how, uh, how the tropical cyclone is evolving over time. So when you have, uh, so we have two animations here. I have an animation on the left of when you're getting those microwave imagery passovers. So the synthetic, the regular microwave imagery passovers are happening in an irregular interval because it's a polar orbiting satellite. Um, versus the visible imagery, which you can get from the geostationary satellites, the visible imagery you can get every five to 10 minutes or even faster. And what we've done is train the AI model to mimic that microwave imagery based on the visible imagery so that you can get a continuous set of what is, we're calling simulated microwave imagery for the different tropical cyclones. And then the goal is to use that synthetic microwave imagery to learn about the tropical cyclone intensification. So we can, for example, do a better job of predicting intensification over time. Um, so this is an animation of of one of those. Um, and I think that this is showing how we're doing that. So it's a traditional convolutional neural network. It's got input from the visible satellite imagery, input from the microwave imagery to learn to mimic that microwave imagery. And then you can, uh, get, so all the channels that are visible to give you just the synthetic microwave imagery where you can actually see the tropical cyclone. Um, and then this is another example of it happening. It is up and running. You can go to that QR code that's there. Um, and you can see this working on past storms. I don't think that there's, I didn't look today, not a tropical cyclone researcher myself. I don't know that there's any tropical cyclones out there right now. It is not really the season, um, but I'm willing to be wrong, but you can go see past storms as well. Uh, and you can see how well it's working. And yes, it is by the way, bringing us back full circle to some of the other things I talked about. It's creating good imagery, but it's fuzzy imagery. Um, and so how can we improve that imagery so that we can then uh, do a better job of understanding the in tropical cyclone intensification. And then bringing us to yet one more full circle, we're creating synthetic imagery and we're going to try to do foundational science discovery on synthetic imagery. Are there any ethical and re responsible AI concerns on that? We're learning something that might, we might hypothesize as foundational science on synthetic imagery. So are there ethical uh, concerns with that? I think there should be, by the way. And, and the key is to acknowledging that those concerns are there and then making sure that we're validating as much of what we're doing on real data so that we're sure that what we're working is, that we've discovered is not just an artifact of the AI product. Um, I make sure that I'm sticking to my time. This is, a, this is a set of questions, for example, that we seek to answer. You know, can we identify our rain bands which are associated with tropical cyclone intensification and then ultimately rain and flooding? Could we more easily see the eye in the eye wall? Can we better identify secondary eye walls? That's an interesting question because it's hard right now with the synthetic product because it's, uh, it's fuzzier. Uh, can we better identify the center of the de developing tropical cyclones under the high level cirrus, which you can't, it's a hard thing to do right now with the, the visible imagery only, whereas with the synthetic microwave imagery that can peer through that, you could actually see that structure. And then can we better analyze the timing of the uh, axisymmetration in relation to the intensity change, if specifically looking at rapid intensification. And, you know, given that this has a huge increase in temporal resolution, can we better understand a variety of these processes. So I think I probably talked too fast because it gives me to my last slide, but it gives me to my last slide essentially right on time. Um, what I wanna say is that AI2ES, so this was just a sampling of the things that are happening inside AI2ES. There are a lot of things I didn't talk about. I'd be glad to answer them in the Q and A um, because I probably, well, when we do our NSF review, we do about 300 slides. We don't have time to do that in 45 minutes and we only get given a day. And even there, we're still having to lead some things out. Um, but AI2S is making transformational improvements in, in all of the prediction of weather and climate. But my goal right now, we're in year four AI2S. It's a five-year funding cycle. We're working on renewing for the next five years with NSF. Um, but my goal is to scale up what we're doing to work across different uh, government agencies, because what we're doing, we're, we've got a narrow focus on that foundational science and um, working on understanding trust, because that's what NSF is very much interested in. But we're, as a whole, interested in trying to make us more resilient, looking at those UN sustainability goals. We want to make us more resilient to climate change. And that involves partnerships across 
agencies. It involves international partnerships and it, may, it needs to make sure we grow our social science team and they're fully integrated so that we're working with a wide variety of end users, including the general public, so that we understand their needs and that what we're developing is trustworthy for everybody. So my goal is to create this larger scale center. How am I going to do that? That is still very much under discussion. I'm working on it. I'm planning on taking a sabbatical next year to actually get this going. Um, but if you have questions and you want to talk about how we can do that, I will be glad to talk about that more. I'm glad to talk about any of this more. Um, and I think I'll end right there. That is the the, the support from NSF is listed right there as well. Fantastic. And Duncan, I assume you want me to stop sharing screen. Um, yeah, there might be some some opportunities to, to bring back up some slides, but uh, that would be perfect. Thank you so much, Amy. That was a great overview of a huge amount of work that, that's going on there. Um, and, and this question of trustworthiness and, you know, how we apply AI in a ethical and fair way, I think is getting more and more um, important as it, as it's getting used more and more. Um, there was a brief clarification in, uh, in, one, in the chat already. Will you be able to share those, those slides with those useful links to the, to the papers and so on? Um, or Sure. I, c I can just make a PDF of it and then send it to you. That would be ideal. Yeah. And then we can put it on the website. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Great. So that will be available and people can, can reflect on that um, afterwards. There's a question coming in um from michael spicer so uh, thank you for your interesting talk what do you think about the idea of integrating adversarial thinking into convergence and trustworthy ai for example in the form of a team activity of thinking up the best ways to fool the ai and f into false predictions using domain knowledge so i guess red teaming the uh, the ai um observing what happens could increase trust and convergence i think that's a fascinating idea um i am Unaware that the social science team is working on that, but I think that, that we did it in the summer school a little bit um, when we were doing. So in the summer school paper that I mentioned, we did something that was not a traditional hackathon. We did something we call a trustathon, where we gave them an AI model and then they had to learn how they could trust it. And some of that could be cer certainly a red team on trust, right? You come up with a team and you say all the ways we could try to break this model. And then if we don't manage to break the model, then we improve our trust. Um, so that, so in some sense, we've done some of that. Um, but I don't, you know, the interviews that we're doing, it's more about here's the model and here's how you do it. But I think that the forecasters themselves could certainly come into that too. Well, I want right. to see it work on the following five methods and, oh, well, it didn't. Or, oh, well, it did, you know? I yeah. One thing about weather models, by the way, is that nobody has a perfect weather model. So even though we're creating, you know, better weather models, we have not, if, if, if a perfect AI for weather model comes out there, we'll all be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a great idea. Perfect. Um... The uh, and actually that that kind of speaks. I had a, I had a question on the the your last example, the synthetic trop tropical cyclone imagery. Um, I mean, conceptually, it's quite similar to data assimilation, right? You can you can imagine you're, you're bringing in different observations that have different cadences, and you're trying to kind of produce an overall picture. Do you think do you foresee opportunities to link these kind of approaches, bring the modeling and observations closer together, perhaps with AI? Yes. I don't think it'll be within AI2ES's current scope, but it may happen in the future. But I think that there are plenty of other people who are working on it. I think data assimilation is I definitely the data and, and the observations and the modeling. It's all going to be melded into one AI model at some point. And it's going to have to have physics in there because yeah. we can't just data driven everything. In my opinion, I'm going to make that bold statement. It's going to make some people mad because there are a lot of people who think that you're just learning the physics from the data. But I think that we need to have the physics in there as part of the trust because it gets to those out of sample questions, right? If you just learned your physics from the data that you observe, but now you get something that's completely different that you've never seen, a super cold spell or that crazy hot spell that happened in the Pacific Northwest, what, two years ago right. that nobody wanted to believe the models at first because, oh, they'd never seen something that was that crazy. You know, we have to have physics in there so that we have some amount of trust, like but that will also get us into the data. Yeah, it was. But I mean, I think that gets us into the data assimilation as well. Right now, the data assimilation, I think, is ripe for machine learning. Um, it is kind of slow. And it would be really nice to be able to take that data simulation and just ingest that data very quickly and produce a nice consistent model. But I think you'll need the laws of physics in there. I think you're gonna have to have a hybrid model. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Norman uh, Avia asks a, a good question actually. So following up again on this, this um, idea of uh, simulating GOES data. So is there any work with AI in order to enhance the, the rain rate estimation of GOES 16 in a way to tackle the lack of radar for example, or specifically for Latin America? Ooh, I'm going to answer that question, but in a way that is not AI2ES, um, because I'm also doing consulting for Google, and I work for Google Africa. Uh, and that I know that we have been working, because also Latin America may have a lack of, ra of radar coverage, so does Africa. Um, <laughs> they're very similar. 
Um, there are, there is definitely work on making synthetic radar products, which would be very much in line with that. Um, there, there is one that you can public, publicly find out about, but you can't get a hold of the algorithm because it was developed for the Air Force. Um, MIT Lincoln Labs has a algorithm that does synthetic weather radar across the entire uh, globe. But, and I understand you can get a hold of the data after it's passed, like it's, I think it's seven days old, you can get a hold of that data, but actually getting the algorithm requires a license with MIT. But there are other people out there who are trying to work on creating it. MIT has published a paper on it. So you can go look at their paper. You know, we're trying to work on something similar. Um, we're not focusing on Latin America and the Google for, in the AI for weather in Google Africa, but we're working on it in Africa. Um, so I think this is, this is doable. I think that it, it's hard though. Right, because getting that truth data is really hard. At least with the satellite microwave imagery data, you have passes occasionally. Um, you have that for the for the radar data, but it's very rare. You're getting like GPM data, but it's yeah. it's rare, and it's yeah. the QC on it is not always perfect. We right. are we're and, very and lucky I mean, in the United States to have that data, but we'd like it everywhere. Sure. <laughs> sure, yeah, and ideally you calibrate it to gauges anyway right you have some 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 actual ground truth because the radar isn't isn't perfect either i guess um, right well it turns out that there's a lack of gauges in a variety of the global south as well so you know i the the global north has a lot of radar and a lot of gauges and you can do all this true thing and then you go to apply it to the global south and you say well it's working great but you don't really know and that's really a problem yeah yeah no that makes sense there's um, some companies out there. I will add one last thing. And that is, there's some companies out there, private industry companies that are working on putting up some satellite data to try to improve some of that data. So there'll be some amount of data to help train to and have more observations. Yeah, that'd be super valuable. Uh, we have another question from uh, Eric Levine. Uh, are there opportunities with AI2S for citizen science participation or open source software development? Excellent question. Uh, I, everything we're doing is open source. So I would say yes on the open source. Although if you want to, there isn't a specific project that, oh, okay, everything's being developed open source. If you want to get involved in a specific project, I think the answer is to say to email, probably, uh, I think I had to take down the contact form on our webpage, email me. I had to take that con on the contact form because I was getting with Russian bots. It literally was Russian coming in. I don't know how they were getting around my uh, CAPTCHAs, but they were, uh, but <laughs> need better AI for that. But you can email uh, me and we can get you involved in that project. Um, in terms of the citizen science, like collecting data, we don't have any of that right now, it will be through our partners, right? So the citizen science data that we're ingesting from NOAA or from our other partners. Um, and I'd say to get involved in those. Uh, but I think that's a great idea. And, and we do have an open source agreement. Everything we're doing is Creative Commons uh, zero. So it's the most open of all the open sources. So we're happy to, to do that. Fantastic. Just no, don't start great. emailing me a bunch of Russian bots. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so there, there is this uh, lab in in Oxford. I was there. The Galaxy Zoo people have opened up a whole number of kind of citizen science experiments. I think there are definitely opportunities because, you know, as we just described, there's a lack of ground truth data and label labels are right. ideas you have them. It's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, I guess, citizen broader interest in these in these topics. I agree. Um, just a bit beyond the scope of our funding. So, but it right, could be sure. for the larger scale institute, which I'm hoping to get going. Makes sense. Um, I had a kind of broader question myself, actually, uh, if I may. So there, I didn't notice any examples in, in, in your whole level overview, but you may well be working on, on generative models in some of these projects, um, including large language models, diffusion models, and so on. But I kind of feel these pose a slightly different category of risk and slightly harder questions of trustworthiness. And I wonder what, you know, yes. what you've thought about those in, in your institute. So we had to add those in because when we wrote the proposal and, you know, you give NSF a scope and you tell them what you're going to do, none of that existed. Um, we've had to add those in in the last year. Um, creating the generative models really right now is out of the scope of the resources we have available. We are not Google. We do not have an unlimited amount of TPUs available to us. But what we've decided to do is focus on the trust question, which is very much what you're asking. And so to, to focus on how can we better understand the trust in those global AI models and whether or not it's meeting the end user needs. And that's very much within our scope. Um, sometime in the next month-ish, um, we have a data set that'll be released that is uh, an archive of a bunch of the different global models, um, but we're, we're trying to get the paper out to go with it, right? So it'll be released when the paper comes out with it. Um, but the, the idea is that that'll help make the community as a whole be able to dive into these models better and to study them. And then we're working on a bunch of papers on trying to understand like how different phenomena are represented. Because I think what you're seeing in the private industry when they're putting out these, public, these blog posts and news inter articles is, oh, this worked great on this, right? But they're picking it worked great on that, but how does it work overall, right? 
And so we're just, as, as for the AI2S, this is definitely a collaboration um, between us and uh, Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere, which is CIRA, uh, yep. because they're the ones who generated that data. And then we're going to work together to try to better improve the trust. But I don't have, the first step of results is that we'll have the data available for everybody and then there'll be papers coming out from there. I yeah. think it's it's just it's a it's a growing need. We really need to understand the trust in this, especially with the number of people who just say flat out at AMS this year. I was shocked. The number of people who are just saying, "Oh, but it's learning all the physics it needs," and I'm like, "You can't say that necessarily." <laughs> <laughs> I was stuck remote because I had COVID, and so I'm like sitting there in the chat going, "No," <laughs> but I couldn't actually get in the discussion. And hand wringing remotely. <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> Good. Yeah, there no, I think advantages to think being that's... remote, but there were disadvantages. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and what about, I mean, large language models? I've seen seen some claims that, you know, you can use these to to make forecasts and, and you know, somehow they, again, they just learn everything they need to know about. I haven't seen anybody make anything that's uh, reasonable out of said large language model. One application I have seen out of the large language models, which I think is interesting, and it has not, it's just starting to be understood and reviewed, um, is can you translate forecasts into all the local languages? And I think that's actually a really good application of the large language model. So, and can you translate it in a way that's impactful, right? You don't just wanna translate word for word because you wanna be able to explain to people what the impacts are for them. And you right. wanna be able to do it in a way that's reliable. And I think that's something that the large language models could do really well at. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that's yeah. the idea. I've seen a preliminary study of trying to do English and Spanish, which you know is a large audience, right? But it, even that is not as easy as you would think. And we got to get that right before we can go to these languages that have a couple hundred people speaking it. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, okay, one one last question, and again, it's a slightly um, slightly broader question. I I'm kind of struck by, and I've been thinking recently about how these questions of trustworthiness and and you know the the scrutiny that which I think is right that we give these AI models how or what we can learn from. Um, the social science questions and, and things you've asked in that regard to the physical models like what can we take from you know thinking really hard about how we trust these models back to the physical models because those aren't perfect either right and we have to acknowledge right. that think about that is that is, you know have we learned something more fundamental or broader about modeling and how we use models i don't no, if we've learned anything surprising, I mean, the question, maybe we have, some people seem to think that trust is just a binary that you can trust it or not trust it. And to me, that's not surprising because it's not true. The trust is a spectrum and really that's what it is. And so the, that, but we've got that demonstrated now that you, that trust is a spectrum and that you get it from experience. Um, yeah. And then also that the end users really want to have that experience. And I think maybe getting to your question about what we can learn to put back into the models, the interactivity is something that I think that they really want. Um, they want to be able to take the AI model and say, but what if I change the input this way? Then what does it give me, yeah. right? And that yeah. that is something that traditional AI people is more feed forward. Here you go, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, Here's a black box. And, and mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a black box. But being able to look inside that black box and actually really play with the inputs and see what it does, I think is something that's, it's interesting. Yeah, you want to be able, you want to help people build an intuition, but feel that feel yeah. familiar, familiarity with the, with the model somehow, even if they don't necessarily understand how it works. Right. They don't have to understand. I mean, a deep, who's going to understand completely a deep network, right? But you can understand where it's going to work, how it's going to work, and maybe the, the regimes, the climate regimes or the weather regimes that it's going to work in. And and like we said at the beginning, no weather model is perfect. So maybe the ones that it doesn't work in, right? You'd like to see that too, because then you learn, I'm going to ignore the AI model here, but I'm going to use it for all these other regimes. That's what right. happens with the physics-based models right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes, makes complete sense. Great. Well, this is a fantastic talk. Um, thank you so much again for your time um, and the great uh, QA session after. Uh, there, there will be people around on, on the neural network afterwards if you have a chance to check it out. But um, yeah, I'm you're... logged in. I have to ask you. I don't really know what that means. Do I okay. like click on the stage or something, or how do I go over there to go join the networking? <laughs> Our, our tech person will help you help you imminently. Okay. Um, but right now we'll we'll wrap up. Um, I think we're going to have a closed down video, and um, so it just remains to to thank you again for your time, and um, we'll leave it there. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions.
Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for good program. Let's shape the future of AI for good. The AI for Good Global Summit, convened by ITU, recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others, to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much.
Thank mm-hmm. you.